So we've been learning about what major topic? So we've been looking at the book of Psalms. I need to turn there to find it to begin with. Today we'll be focusing on Psalm 122. And how many people organized the book of Psalms? Do you remember that one? Three different people organized the book of Psalms. The most prominent one being David. And there were two lesser notes. When we look at the book of Psalms, it's different from every other book in the Bible because it is man's words to God. Not that it's not inspired, but when you look at all the other books of the Bible, God is talking to man. It was there are five different books in the book of Psalms, book one, book two, book three, book four, and book five. And they correspond with the five books of the Pentateuch, or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now we are on Psalm 122, and what collection is Psalm 122 part of? The Psalms of Ascent. And what's so special about the Psalms of Ascent? What's so special about the Psalms of Ascent? When were they saying? When they were going to the temple. So the Psalms of, of Ascent are Psalms of Degrees. They are the Psalms that the Jews would sing as they're traveling to the temple. Some speculate that they were the Psalms that they sang as they were on each step of the temple going into it. But regardless, they were the Psalms that were sung by the Jewish people as they went in, uh, to, to, towards Jerusalem to the temple. Now, when we look at the Psalms so far, what stands out about the individual in Psalm 119, Psalm 20, and Psalm 121? What kind of person are we talking about? Was he a inhabitant of Jerusalem? No. Was he a inhabitant of this earth? When we look at their viewpoint, they do not see themselves as somebody who belongs here on this earth, but rather they saw themselves as a traveler, as a sojourner. And we get the same idea from Abraham in the book of Hebrews, where he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So when we're looking at the Song of Ascents, or Psalms of Degrees, that's the impression we get. We're not going to get that sense right out, like it was stated in Psalm 119 and 120, that I'm just a traveler, but we do still have that aspect that this person who was just wandering through. He wasn't permanently there, but he was traveling from one place to another location. He was going from point A to point B. Now, as we get ready to study Psalm 122, I'll go ahead and read it as usual, and we'll prepare to go over the key words, key phrases, key verses. So Psalm 122, where the Bible reads, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. 
For my brethren and my and companions sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. So when we're looking at this, what, and we'll start off broad, what might be a key verse or key verses of Psalm 122? The first verse, go ahead and read that, brother. Okay. Does anybody else have any thoughts on what would be the key verse? What verse summarizes this entire passage? Verse 6, what does verse 6 state? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Are there any other takes on what might be a key verse, or is that about all? Really, when it comes down to it, I consider verse 6 probably the key verse. Pray for the peace of Israel. Because when we talk about, there's what? Nine verses. Nine of the verses, in one way or the other, are talking about the peace of Jerusalem in one form or fashion. So that is the utmost um, message of Psalm 122. Now what about key phrases for this chapter? What might be some key phrases? How about just the peace of Jerusalem? Because really that's what the whole passage is about. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So the peace of Jerusalem, because that's what the author of Psalm 122 is concerned about. The peace there. Now we get into some key words. What might be some key words to describe and sum up Psalm 122? Really, when it comes to Psalm 122, it's not that hard to come up with a key word or key phrases because there's not really a whole lot to be to munch on there. It's all right there. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we got peace, we could throw out Jerusalem, and we could throw out pray if we really wanted to. But when we look at Psalm 122, it's practically all it's all about the peace of Jerusalem. And the reason that he wants the peace of Jerusalem is summarized in the very last verse. Probably more so than anything else because it says <coughs> that's where God's at. That's where his temple is at. If we go to verse 9, because of the house of the Lord of our God, I will seek thy good, or I will seek peace. I will seek for the prosperity of Jerusalem. If we keep going down our typical study on the book of Psalms, we typically have it divided into, um, the next section would be, is, it, is any passage in Psalm 122 quoted anywhere in the New Testament? And from what I can find, there is none. It does not appear in any shape or form in the New Testament. The poetic style, I really could not come up with it. Uh, it almost seems like you get to a point, you have line a, B, C, and then at D, and then it just goes right back to D, C, B, A. So you kind of have that. I'm not sure what they call that, but that's pretty much the poetic style of it. The history of it. There's really not a known history of it. We know that they sang it when they went to the temple. They sang it as they were on the journey to the temple. Is there any indication of who might have written this song? David. That's what my Bible says as well. From what I can see, I don't really see it in my nose notes, uh, in the verses itself, but according to Dig, according to Spurgeon, according to whoever wrote Brother Eli's Bible or edited it, put their notes in there, a lot of people attribute Psalm 122 to David. 
And if we look at it being as a psalm of David, there should be something that we should know about it. Because when David was come in, he was the one who constructed the city. He's the one that built it, the city. So when we look at Psalm 122, it's almost as from the viewpoint of a visionary. Somebody who's already looking into the future and already has it done. If we want to put it in today's concept, it is in the architect's chamber where they would meet with their, with their consumer, with their client, and they might have a little mini diagram set up. This is where this is going to be. This is where this is going to be. There's a wall here. There's restrooms over here. If it's a house, this is the dining room. They have it all laid out in a little mini model. In the author's mind, who many claim is David, he already sees a city built up. He already sees the temple built. He already sees the canals, the walls, the passageways. In his mind's eye, as he's writing Psalm 122, is as if the city is completed. He is seeing it in all its full grandeur and splendor. And because of that, there's only one thing that he's concerned about. And that is maintaining the peace of the city. His heart is there. He longs for it. Now when we look at Psalm 122, and we start at verse 1, what does verse 1 state? It states, I'm, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. In our mind's eye, does that bring any other biblical passages to memory? You're nodding your head, brother. What passage does it bring to memory for you? Or are you just nodding along for the right? You're just nodding along for the right. Just being in God's house. Just being in God's house. But there is one other passage in the Bible that relates directly to the house of the Lord. If someone would please read 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. 1 Kings chapter 10. Verses 4 and 5. When the queen of Sheba had, said, had seen all Solomon's wisdom in the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and their cupbearers, and his accent, accent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. <laughs> so here... King Solomon gets a visitor. Somebody from Ethiopia, all the way down in Africa, heard about this king to the east, and his splendor, and his wisdom, and the beauty of his palace, and his grandeur, and all these great things. And she came up to see if it was true. Almost as if somebody came up and told you about some great, magnificent place, and you go, you know what? I bet you they're like, I need to go check it out for myself. So you go and check it out, and you know what? It's not even half as true as what they've said, because it's more magnificent and splendid, and words cannot even begin to describe it. She goes up and tests Solomon. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 10 that every question that she had in her heart, he answered. His wisdom was beyond Compare. There was none like this man. And she sat there through question after question after question. But you know what? Nothing struck the Queen of Sheba quite like King Solomon's entrance when he went to the house of God. She was marveled by the palace. She was taken back by the beauty of the temple. The gold, the brass, the marble perhaps. But none of that stuff made her breath away or made her faint, literally physically faint, as of the sight that Solomon had of Solomon entering into the house of the Lord. Should that not be the same in our own lives? Should we not be excited about going to the house of God? There is no place like the house of God. 
Now, I know people aren't perfect, and we can have our time alone with God, and that's great. But you ever get together with a group of believers that they just want to worship God? In all honesty, if we're being honest, there is a big difference going into one of our normal church services on Sunday morning versus going into a fellowship meeting. Just feeling the presence of God there. Why? Probably because there's a lot more people that have come with the mindset, you know what, I've come to worship God. I don't have to be here today. I know God's not taking attendance tonight because that seems to be the thing on a lot of people's minds nowadays. I need to make my weekly visit to church, so I'll show up on Sunday. But man, when we gather with one mindset and one accord, and we haven't come because it's Sunday to get to church, but we have come with an anticipation that we're going to meet God. Not just we hope God will, but we come with an anticipation and that mindset. Man, it could blow away everybody we know. You know, you go to church on Sundays, but why are you going on Tuesday nights? And now you're going on a Friday night yet. There should be something about the true Christian, the child of God, that says, you know what? I'm going to go to church. And that makes other people marvel and take notice. The Bible says that the way that um, King Solomon entered, it literally, physically took her breath away. She passed out. She couldn't believe it. There was nothing about that sight, whether it was the sight of Solomon and his robes ascending the staircase to enter into the temple, whether it was his anticipation, you know what, you come, but you know what, today's our holy day. If you want to, don't want to come to church, that's fine. You can stay here, but I'm going to the house of my God. How much more should that be the, our mindset and our thought pattern? You know, and not just that, but our anticipation. We can come to church to come to church. But when we come with an anticipation, I'll tell you what, that changes the playing field altogether. And when we come with an anticipation, and brother so-and-so comes with an anticipation, and sister so-and-so comes with an anticipation, I'm telling you what, if there is no division in the church and the Holy Ghost can move, you can just feel the presence of God building when you enter the sanctuary. And I'll tell you what, when worship lets loose, the Holy Ghost lets loose. How much more should we be excited when we come into the house of God? And that brings into question a, uh, another thing when it comes to us. We can talk about the peace of uh, Jerusalem, but if we're really going to come and see God move, well, we can't be fighting with sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. And if we do have ought against him, and some, we can't control what, what other people feel. If Brother Dennis is angry at me, I can't stop him from being angry at me. But I can control how I am. And if he wants to sit over there and be angry, no, I, I know you're not. But if somebody wants to sit, I mean, get up and walk out, I'm done with this. But if somebody wants to come to church and you, they want to be angry, there is no reason for us to feed that. Because when we feed their anger, we are allowing the devil to work. Because if somebody comes in already angry at somebody, there's already division possibly working in the midst. And when we give in and we let that spirit come up, because that spirit will come over and try to agitate us. Even if we're not aware that there's a spirit agitating us, something will come up and start stirring up feelings. We're automatically allowing the devil to work in the service. And when the devil starts working in the service, God can't work the way he wants to. There's already a hindrance and there's already a barrier. Or if something happens during the service and some, we respond the wrong way and something similar to that, once again, we hinder the spirit of God from moving. But if we come with an anticipation that I don't care if so-and-so is angry at me, I don't care if they have all, that's between them and God. I've come to worship God. And I'm not going to let the devil come in if they make any snide remarks, if they start talking. I'm not going to let it bother me, at least not in this church and in this church service, because if I do, I've already let the devil work in my own life, and I've already hindered the service from progressing the way God wants to. But... There is an anticipation. When we are glad to enter into the house of the Lord, we've come with one purpose, and that is to meet with God. And when we are glad that we are there, there's not anything in this world that we're going to let hinder that. And if we are glad and we know that we're not going to let anything hinder it, we're going to do everything we can 
to be on our guard that when the devil comes in, we say, you know what? Get away from me. I come to worship God. This is not your time. This is not your place. This is not your house. You get away from me. You want to bother me? Get me at home because at this point in time, I am in God's house. I have come to worship my God. I don't care what my situation is at home. I don't care what my situation is with so-and-so. I don't care what my financial needs look like. I don't know. I don't really care what I feel like emotionally on the inside because we can come in all turmoil to begin with. But I have come to God's house. I am glad to be in God's house and I have come to worship God. And I was let them say to me, I was glad when they said unto me, I can go into the house of my God. That should be every Christian's desire and attitude when the church doors are open. I am glad to be in my God's house. I have come to worship Him. And there isn't any force on this earth, and there's no force in hell that is going to prevent me from worshiping my God and pushing everything aside and getting my mind on Him. Then we get down into verse 2, where our focus gets one to the city of Jerusalem itself. Where the Bible states, Jerusalem is our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. So now we have the anticipation that we're going to get to the temple, and before we get to the temple, we're going to get into the holy city. My feet is going to put there, and to my mind's eye, it almost brings on that old song that uh, we sang it here some way, way long ago. Watch ye therefore, you know not the day, when the Lord shall call my soul away. So, oh, and now you get to the Lord. This is why I should do things off the cuff. But it says something about when my feet strike Zion, I'm going to lay down my heavy burden. I'm going to put on my robes in glory, and I'm going to shout the glass door. You know, we get the idea of this author when he gets to the city. You know what? I don't have to worry about the attack of the enemy from being on the path anymore. He is far behind me. The doors are shut. I'm in my safe place. I'm in the holy city, and I'm just steps away from reaching the temple. I'm in God's city. All my enemies are behind me. And I am pressing forward. And not only that, he comes with that joy and anticipation. I'm going to come to my house. But now there is safety. There is security. My foot shall not be moved. I am standing within the holy gates. And when the gates are shut, no enemy can prevail against me. The, verse 3 states that Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. It is built up. It is exactly how it should be. I have come with those of my relatives, I have come with those fellow Christians, I have come with those fellow worshipers. When we go down to verse 4, it kind of ties in with verse 3, so we'll back it up here in a second. Verse 4, whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord under the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. When we look at verse 3 and 4 together, if we go down to verse 4, we kind of have a singleness or a dividing or a separating. This is the tribe of Dan. This is the tribe of Joseph. This is the tribe of Levi. They're all separate and distinct. What does that mean in our terms? This is brother Eli. This is sister Stacy. This is sister Beth. This is brother Dennis. This is brother Laman. Out in the world, we are Christians in our own right. We are children of the Most High God. We are separate, we are unique, we are distinct, and we are different. We are put in different places for different purposes. <coughs> Brother Dennis is up there with his garage. He reaches people I can't reach. I work down at Walmart. I can reach people that Brother Eli can't reach. Sister Beth works at the school. She reaches people that none of us can reach. We are all children of God. But if we back up to verse 3, Jerusalem is compact together. What does that mean? That means on Sunday morning right now, you're not just Brother Dennis. You're not just Sister Beth or Brother Eli or Brother Justin. We are the church of the living God. We are compact together in one location. It's not just us individually now, but we are the church. We are the living God, um, the house of the living God. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And when we gather in one mindset, one uh, of course, we are not just the body outreach, but we are the body unified. 
brought together, and we and we have come together with gladness, with singleness of heart and singleness of mind. We are no longer just brother and sister so and so, but we are the church. And it, we talk about that rope that's made up of many forts. Individually, we are so strong in the world, but when we come together, we are a core that cannot be broken. Out in the world, we are off on our own to some degree. Not that God's not with us, but man, there's powers in numbers. Peter, when he walked down the streets, his shadow passed over people, and they were miraculously healed. But what happened in Acts chapter, I believe it's 5, when the church was assembled together in one mindset and one accord, and they prayed for a Holy Ghost boldness. Man, brother Peter and sister Mary and brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, when they got in one house with singleness of mind and they were glad to be there, the Bible says that the place was shaken because of the power of God. Out in the world, we are powerful because of the Spirit that is through us. But we are single. Man, when we get together with brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, and we get to the church especially, and we have come with one mindset and one accord, then we are compact together. Then we are one body. We are one living organism. We are one living unit. And that makes all the difference. <clears throat> Going farther down in verse 5. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. When you talk about Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the religious center of Israel, but it was also the political center of Israel. What do I mean by that? That's where the king resided. That's where the seat of power resided. And if I have a problem with my wife that cannot be solved on the low court level, guess where we went? You went to the throne of the king. When there was a trouble with two women and one claimed that their son... Um, was the same child? That's mine. No, it's mine. Where did they go? To the throne of Solomon for him to dispute it and answer the problem. He was the judge. When we look at Jerusalem, that was the place of judgment. That's where things came. When it comes to the church, this is also the place of judgment. This is the very first place that God comes. Not that you come over and you judge sister so-and-so. Say, I know what you've been doing all week. Or brother so-and-so. But it is the place of judgment. This is the place where we come and we let God deal with us to make sure that we are right with him. He is the judge of the universe. And when it comes to the final day, when we stand in judgment, guess who we're going to stand before? We're going to be standing before God Almighty. And I'll tell you what, it is a whole lot better to let God judge us here Say, you know what, God, you're right. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to get it cleared up. I'm going to do what I have to, whether it be spending more time in prayer, reading the Bible more, or rather, I need to change an area in my life. It is better for God to judge us now and give us time to change it that we may be transformed into His very image even farther than stand before Him on Judgment Day and see that hay, wood, and stubble burned up and say, Him judge us there and said, You should have done this. You should have done that. Well, you didn't tell me. I tried, but you wouldn't change. Because on that day, it's too late. Whatever rewards we're getting on that day, we've already earned them in this life. But when we come to the house of the Lord with gladness, we will gladly take the correction from the Lord. We will gladly accept that reproof and say, you know what, Lord, I need to change your eye in my life. I might not be able to do it, but I need you to help me to do it. That shows that we're willing to change. When we're willing to come to the house of the Lord and say, God, change me. Make me into your image. We do it with gladness, not out of fear. God doesn't chase his children hoping that they are afraid of him. He chases them out of love because they need a change. Because how can a holy God dwell in the middle of an unholy people? God's changing us to be molded into the image of Jesus Christ. And when we look at verse 5, there is set thrones of judgment. The house of God is also where the throne of God is to pass judgment upon each one of us that we may be changed into the farther image of Jesus Christ. And as I've already said, it is better for us to receive correction now and allow God to change us 
and stand on that day ashamed, saying, God, I'm sorry I didn't do that. Or you're not, this is the reward I had for you, but because you didn't change in this area, you're not able to receive this reward. And when it comes to the word of God, to absolute correction, because people will not change, where does God begin with his correction? Where does his judgment begin? It's not with the heathen. It's not with the world. But I believe it's the book of Ezekiel where he said, judgment begins at my house. You know, the judgment has already begun being passed in different churches in America in this day and age because they know not who God is. And God is already starting to weed out the church. He's already passing his judgment upon them. And why would not God's judgment start with his children? As a parent, you're raising your kids. You don't start correcting other people's kids. You focus on your own first. You know, I can't control what they do at their house, but in our house, we do it this way. Why wouldn't God start with his children? Why God, wouldn't God start with his house? Not that he doesn't love everyone, but we are his people, and we are the sheep of his pasture. We are the ones that he looks after carefully. Verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and prosperity. Oh, they shall prosper that love thee. So we have the command or the prayer of David, the author of the song. Pray for Jerusalem, for they shall prosper that love thee. This is also one of those verses that people take in their prayer that pray for Israel because God will bless you. But he starts off with pray for the peace and prosperity of Jerusalem. Because if a city is going to be successful, it's got to prosper. I mean, we look at this world and as much as we rely on God, we also realize things take money. We can pray for God to send us souls. We can pray for God to allow us to do outreach. But even if we do outreach, it takes money. If we're going to live, it takes money. You want to eat? take money. You want to drive your car? It takes money. Not that we love money, but it's the reality of things. We have to be prosperous to some degree so our bills may be paid. Even if God slips us an envelope in the mailbox, or God pays, takes care of a bill, it was taken care of. But he prospers somehow. Then he goes, pray uh, peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Why would he say that? Because what did Abraham Lincoln say about America? If we're going to fall, we're going to fall not from an enemy outside, but we're going to fall from within. He was praying for the peace of those within the walls and the peace within the palaces because if there's turmoil within the common people, well, then what happens? You have a civil war in your hand. You have to break it up, divide it up, and the city's not what it's supposed to be. It's going to be destroyed in some fashion or another. If there's division within the palaces, well, then we have political instability. And we've already seen what happens with that. People being private, Absalom met in private, talking against David, trying to overthrow the government. We saw, we can go to history and look at different African nations that had coup d'etats where the nation was divided and it trickled down to the citizens and then there's famine and there's pestilence, there's war. If a city's going to be successful, the people within the city must be unified. The political powers that be must be unified. They must work together because if they don't, the whole thing's going to crumble apart. And why was he praying for this? We get to the answer in verse 9. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. It all comes down to it. Jerusalem is the place where God's house is. This is where the temple is. And if the temple is going to remain intact, if it's going to continue on, 
then those within the city must be unified. Otherwise, God's house will be torn apart. If they're not under political stability, God's house will be torn apart. And we literally saw that come to pass years and years later. What happened when Nebuchadnezzar came in to Jerusalem? There was political instability. There was trouble within the walls. And Nebuchadnezzar came in and he ransacked the temple and he destroyed it. Later, Naaman went out. The high priest, whose name is Leap, is Leap now. Far from me at this point, they started building the temple. Romans came in, took over. Not that the Israelites still had control, but Herod built up the temple even farther. And then finally, in 70 A.D., Titus came in and said, you know what? We as Romans had, a, had enough, and they tore down the temple, stone by stone. Because of political instability, the house of God was lost. Was lost. And this was the fear of David. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. He didn't seek the good of Jerusalem for Jerusalem itself. He looked for the good of Jerusalem because that's where God resided. And his house was holy and it was precious. That was the place that he was glad to go to year after year after year. As the traveler would journey with their sacrifice from their home city to Jerusalem. It was a place that they could rejoice at. I am glad I am going there. God has provided a way of escape for my sin. And I'm going to meet with my God. And in order to make sure that his house remains intact, I'm going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm going to pray for those in political power. I'm going to pray that the people would be unified and not torn apart. Because I want to say, I was glad to go to house when I was able to, to go into the house of my God. And I was able to go there with gladness. Not out of fear, not out of wonder or, or hoping that that house will still be remain intact, that that church will still be there. But I know that if I pray for the peace of Israel, if I pray for those in control of leadership, that I have nothing to worry about. And I can go without a shadow of a doubt, without any fear in my life, and they can say of me, I was glad to go into the house right now. Because that's what it comes down to. I just want to go meet with my God. Any thoughts, any questions, anything anybody wants to ask? If not, then let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we, thank, we are thankful that you're God who reigns on high, that there's none like you, Lord. Lord, right now we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may have his way, making himself visible if he so chooses, Lord. And with the song leader and the musicians, as they lead us in worship, lead us in the songs you'd have us to sing. I pray, Lord, that you give them a special blessing as well. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today, and anoint our hearts and our minds to receive your word with gladness. That we are willing to change however you want us to change. That we may see you in your fullness. That we may not be ashamed of that day. That you say, I wanted to give you this, but you wouldn't change. Therefore, you are not eligible for it. Lord, may we set aside any, every weight and every sin that would be easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Willing to change and adapt however you want us to, Lord. Anoint, give the pastor a special blessing today as he brings forth your word. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and everyone said. Amen. How are you doing, Brother Dennis? Pretty decent. I like to show. Good, thank you.